Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm your host, Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us today. So we have a big day today, a very big day today, because we're going to be continuing our coverage of two major trials. The first one is the Todd Kenhammer case out of Wisconsin, this really bizarre case of a man who has been charged with fatally beating his wife of 25 years, Barbara Kenhammer, and staging it as a car accident. That's right, he has claimed that this was a freak accident while he was driving his car. A pipe fell through uh, his windshield from a flatbed truck that was passing by, struck his wife, which resulted in her death. However, however, prosecutors, the state, they say that this was murder and he tried to cover it up. We're gonna talk about that in a minute because that case is slowly coming towards its end. We expect closing arguments today and we'll talk about everything that we know and how the prosecution and defense will wrap up their cases. The other case that we're covering is the Xavier Dobson case out of Tennessee. This really sad case of a 15-year-old high school football player who was shot and killed when he sh shielded his friends from gunfire. That's right. And these shots were alleged to have been fired by those three men. Christopher Jerome Bassett, Richard Gregory Williams III, and Kipling Colbert Jr. Those three men are on trial for this young boy's death. It's been a back and forth between the defense and prosecution about what the motive of this uh, alleged shooting was. Was it... Uh, related? Was it about a girl? What was it about? The reason I'm sure we're showing this rap video is that is a big point of contention in this case. The three defendants are in this rap video and it's being put forward by the prosecution to say they have gang affiliations. Listen to the lyrics. Listen to their propensity to violence. This is important. This shows that this killing was gang uh, related. What we saw yesterday was testimony, which I'll tell you, I don't think I've ever seen anyone uh, testify on this, was a liberal arts professor who testified to hip hop culture and rap music and the lyrics. We'll talk about that as well. But I do want to focus right now on the Todd Ken Hammer case. And there's a lot to talk about. And here to help me talk a little bit more about it is former federal prosecutor Kendall Coffey. Kendall, good to have you back on the Law and, Net on Law and Crime Network. Hey, good morning. Thanks for including me in this fascinating uh, discussion about a fascinating case. Fascinating. That is the key word here, fascinating. So <laughs> now I'm, I'm sure you had the opportunity to see Mr. Ken Hammer take the stand. A lot of people felt he didn't do a great job on the stand. That even if he, even if everything he says is true, that this was an accident, he's leaving more questions for the jury. In ter specifically, the fact that he's having trouble recalling what actually happened during the accident, and why was he in the car with Barb to begin with? What do you think about it? Well, he looked very nervous, uh, tentative, and weak. He got sliced up pretty good on the cross examination. So. <clears throat> it's a reminder of why defense lawyers can be very reluctant to put their client on the stand. On the other hand, uh, there was something about him that didn't seem cruel. Uh, it didn't seem like just look, just looking at him, just kind of listening to him, engaging his tone. He didn't seem like the kind of guy who would violently beat his wife to death. And so... <clears throat> If we were to just take his questions and his answers, you'd give him a pretty poor grade. But uh, I thought there were parts of his uh, demeanor that, that might have seemed uh, vaguely sympathetic. So it wasn't a complete disaster. Obviously, we'll find out when the jury speaks what uh, they thought of his testimony. See, I think it's two opposite sides of the spectrum. The case that we had just covered uh, previously, and Kendall, I don't remember if we had talked about it, was the Adam Matos case. And this guy, when he took the stand, was like a robot. No emotion, no expressions. And you can at least see from Ken Hammer some emotion and, and despair when he's talking about certain details. We're showing the video of it right there. Um, and I wonder, I wonder, in the end, does this spell reasonable, reasonable doubt for at least one juror? Well, he seemed kind of sad, didn't he? Uh, and, I mean, that could be sad because he fears the consequences of being a murderer, but it could also be sad because his, his wife was, uh, uh, it, it, it was killed. And, you know, I didn't think that the uh, the prosecution had a real clear thesis of motive. Uh, for all we know, he loved his wife. And uh, so I think if you take a guy who looks timid, halting, again, got tripped up a lot in cross-examination on some inconsistencies, uh, could the jury see him as somebody who's, uh, frankly, just a... A, a husband who loved his wife, who got lost and badly confused in some sort of tragedy. That's certainly the defense argument, and, and it could, I mean, it's, it's not the worst reasonable doubt argument I've ever heard. Then again, 
people who commit uh, murders or commit the serious crimes, they might have never committed a crime, a murder, anything in the past until something has brought them to that point in their life when they actually do it. And we don't know what was spoken in that car. We'll never really understand the intimacy between these two people. Maybe they shared things that they didn't share with anybody else. So as much as we can look in the, from the outside and see what their relationship might have been, the flip side of it is we really don't know. Now, the, the question is, though, for, for this man, what I seem to have an issue with, and I think what more people are having an issue with, is let's talk about the activity before the incident, okay? Barb Kenhammer really wasn't late to work. We looked at, they looked at her work record, she wasn't late. She showed up at eight o'clock. If she was going to be late, she had to call her office and to let them know that she was going to be late. She didn't do that th that morning. She usually called her mother every morning, okay? She didn't call her mother that morning. Todd called her mother that morning. And then let's not forget the fact, where were they going? Uh, two witnesses testified that they didn't arrange with the defendant to replace a windshield that morning like he had originally had said to authorities and under testimony. And the defendant says he was mistaken when he told police the names. He says it was somebody else. He said he was, he, when he looks back at that interrogation tape, it, that wasn't him. How, do, how does a reasonable jury, juror, excuse me, or jury make sense of this activity in the morning? Well, the most, frankly, the most logical explanation is consistent with the prosecution's view of what happened. At every turn where something could have corroborated some part of Ken Hammer's explanation, whether it was a call to the work, a call to the mom, whether there was anybody that wanted windshield glass on the other end of, of the drive, anything at all, it, it seemed like those potential uh, boxes that could have been checked with an item of corroboration all stayed blank. And so if every possibility of corroboration, something to back up what he's saying, simply vanishes, then uh, that puts him in a great deal of, uh, of uh, risk in terms of the jury's views. And you add to that the fact that his testimony was inconsistent on extra, uh, significant points. And of course, the state had expert testimony to attack his theory. So the state has plenty of evidence uh, and uh, his, uh, he's relying on, uh, in effect, the defense's own self-serving testimony, which at times reflects poor memory and which at other times reflects contradiction. So it looks like a very, very uneven fight, uh, and yet he didn't look like a killer, and there is the reasonable doubt standard. Kendall, what do you say to the argument that and Mr. Ken Hammer said this in his own interrogation video, if I was going to do something to my wife, I sure wouldn't have done it like this. Doesn't this seem more of an elaborate scheme to get rid of somebody to stage a car accident? Isn't there a, another way to do it? Doesn't the, the elaborate nature of this kind of go against the prosecution's case? Uh, a little bit. I mean, it's such a complicated story. Uh, and if you take the fact that it's got this, you know, very involved m multiple step story to, to commit the murder with the fact that you don't have evidence that he hated her. You don't have evidence that he told friends he was going to leave her for a sweet young thing. Uh, that, I think, is why this could very well end up being a close case. Yeah. Again, we're talking here with Kendall Coffey about uh, the Ted Todd, excuse me, the Todd Kenhammer case. We expect live coverage in this case at around 1030 a.m. We'll make sure to go to it again. We expect closing arguments in this case for both the state and the defense. And then it'll be up to the jury to decide what to do. Another case, again, we are covering is the Xavier Dobson case. Uh, we might be covering it here on the network. We can also watch it uh, live on the on lawncrime.com. This is the case of uh, this 15 year old high school football player from Tennessee who was shot and killed when he shielded his friends from gunfire. Those shots were alleged to have been fired by Christopher Drone Bassett, Richard Gregory Williams III, and Kipling Colbert Jr. Those three men are on trial. And President Barack Obama, as you see right there, spoke so highly of this young man. Uh, Xavier Dobson died, saving three friends from getting shot. He was a hero at 15. What's our excuse for not acting? ESPN did a 30 by 30 documentary of this young boy. Uh, he was awarded the Arthur Ashe Courage Award. Really sad story. People are following this case. They want some sort of justice, some sort of answers. So again, we will be following that case as well. 
But again, our main focus today right now is the Todd Kenhammer case, partly due to the bizarre nature of the facts. Um, and as Kendall Coffey and I were talking about, there's a lot to dissect. I want to play right now uh, testimony from yesterday when the defense started calling people that uh, knew the Kenhammers, spoke about their relationship, spoke about Todd's love of his wife, Barbara. And then we'll talk about if that was effective or not. Take a look at Tina McCoy. This is the best friend of Barbara Kenhammer. Welcome back to Law and Crime Network, everybody. The uh, audio on that video wasn't great, so I want to play you now the testimony of uh, Todd Kenhammer's son-in-law, Michael Service. He was provided some also context about the relationship between Todd and Barbara, and again, Todd's love of Barbara. So take a listen to this. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. Sorry, the audio on those clips is not great. So we're going to play some testimony from uh, Todd Kenhammer's uh, day on, on the stand. Remember, he took the stand. I'm here with former federal prosecutor Kendall Coffey. Kendall, the idea of a defendant taking the stand, okay, that is, n that is a risky move, correct? Would you, if you were in the opportunity to cross-examine this gentleman, would that have been a field day for you? Would you have had a, a good time doing that? I, I, for many prosecutors, it's the finest hour. It, it doesn't happen nearly enough, but they prepare for it. They have to, even knowing that most of the time the defendant is not going to take the stand. Uh, it's, it's a field day because at times you can bring in things about the defendant's past, if they take the stand, that you couldn't bring in otherwise. Things that might be impeaching or bad acts or other things that happen in the defendant's life. Uh, but a lot of it is just inconsistencies and uh, the, uh, the ability to find different things in the evidence, different things that the uh, defendant may have said to police officers, and then expose all of the contradictions and ultimately present the uh, defendant as, as, as a liar desperately trying to save his own hide. Uh, it's not done most of the time for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's not done is sometimes defendants are just guilty and there's nothing they can really say uh, to, uh, to e extricate themselves. And sometimes even defendants that, that have factual innocence or are factually innocent about part of it are just bad witnesses uh, who can't withstand cross-examination. And then of course, as I just mentioned, a lot of times you hold the defendant off the stand because of all the stuff that might come out if you put the defendant on an exposure. So 
sometimes you got to do it, especially in a tough case and a desperate case. Uh, but it's the most difficult decision any defense lawyer can make, whether to put his or her client on the stand. And it's one of the most uh, important and, frankly, fascinating opportunities for a prosecutor when the defendant raises his or her hands and uh, swears to tell the truth. Exactly. All right, let's play a little bit of uh, Todd Kenhamber under cross-examination, really being grilled here, and uh, we'll be back here with more analysis. And every day that wasn't Labor Day or uh, Friday and Saturday, she called her mother, didn't she? Yes, she did. The time range. And every day that wasn't Labor Day or uh, Friday and Saturday, she called her mother, didn't she? Yes, she did. The time range was around 7.45, give or take five minutes. Am I right about that? Yes. And the times ranged from what, seven to 10 minutes? Yes. Five to, yes, five to 10 minutes. On Friday the 16th, she not only didn't call her mother at 7.45, she also didn't call work when she was going to be late. You have no explanation for that, do you? No, I do not. Did she always keep her purse in the back seat on the seat? Usually, yes. With her phone in it so she couldn't reach it? I sometimes, I'm assuming so. I don't know where she had her phone all the time. Well, you gave her a ride every morning, you said, when you were home and she was working. Yes. When you gave her a ride, wasn't she having the phone with her, talking to her mom? No, not when I was with her. Usually she wouldn't have her phone with her. Would she keep it close to her? I don't know. I don't know where she kept her phone. Okay. You had talked about having no stress in your marriage. You were about to change work schedules on that Friday night, correct? Correct. When did you know about that change? A month before, two months before. Your son thought you had the weekend free, correct? Correct. Barb also thought you had the weekend free? No. Weren't you already in trouble at work for calling in sick too much? No. Didn't you have five points against you at work? I had four points against me at work. For calling in sick? Yes. So you were getting in trouble for calling in sick to work? I would have got a verbal yes. Okay. Well, I'll just ask you. You were getting in trouble for calling in sick too much to work? I hadn't yet, no. Well, you were about to if you called in sick one more time. Yes, I was about to. Friday night, you were going to call in sick anyways? Correct. And risk a warning? Yes. Instead of taking the free day that you could have had, right? Correct. She didn't like you working nights and weekends, did she? She didn't care for it, no. And now instead of camping, you were going to either work or have to call in sick and either miss camping or get one more point against you at work, right? Correct. And you said you switched shifts because you wanted to help a guy out. Is that right? Correct. Isn't it true that you had a problem with the guy on first shift? Um, a lot of people have a problem with somebody on first shift. Were you one of the people that had a problem with the person on first shift? I have a problem with him, yes. And that's why you swift, switched shifts. It was your idea, right? Part of it, yes. Okay. Well, you left that out in your direct exam. I wanted to be complete. Okay. When you said that you were going camping that weekend and you said you're going to use that money for camping. Remember that? Yes. Why did you need money for camping? We didn't. You said that you were going to use that money for camping? Yes. Okay. We would have used it. You said that Barb was the one responsible for bills? Yes. Did you have some unpaid bills in your vehicle? No. I had one, I'm sorry. It wasn't in my vehicle, I don't think, though. What was that one? Allied Electric. And how much did you owe Allied Electric? I think it was 4000 Did you also have a conversation on Thursday by text message with Barbara about another unpaid bill? From um, Best Kept? Yes. Yep. And Barb sent you a photo of a note, and the text message said, nice, exclamation points, right? Yes. And the bill was from January 16th? Yes. And this was September 15th? Yes. And the bill hadn't been, get, hadn't been paid? It had been paid. It was a cash pay. They forgot to mark it paid. Did the note to them say, Todd, how about a little communication on why this is not getting paid? Yes. Sounded like they weren't having ability to reach you from they, January to September? What's that? From January to September? Yes. It's your position that that bill was already paid? Yes. You were flipping houses, and was there a problem with the last house you flipped selling on time? No. Did the cost cost more than you thought? No. 
didn't you have to use some credit cards because you weren't paying the house on time? We did some work in the basement of it is why we did. You had been fired previously by A1 Glass? Correct. And you had left Glass Service Center because it was too hard work for them? It was. What's that? You left Glass Service Center because it was too hard to work for four bosses at once? Yes. And you were in your own business, but you left because of business differences? Yes. Do things have to be your way? No. Were you concerned or was Bard concerned that once again at Crown you're going to have to leave because you're having difficulties with people? No. That you're going to have to change your schedule because you're having difficulties with people? No. When the police noted scratched on your neck, you first said that that was from working with glass, correct? I said that, yes. You don't work with glass at Crown, do you? No. And you work with windshields, but that's not the same as working with broken glass, right? I, I assume when you install windshields, you're not getting scratched up from broken glass. It depends how bad it's broken. Well, were these scratches from glass? No, not, no. not from glass doing at home. You said it was from working with glass. Correct, I said that. That was a lie. It wasn't a lie. It was not true. It was not true. The scratches were from her trying to get you off of her, weren't they? Nope. The two of you were fighting and she was scratching your neck? Nope. She was scratching your neck, her neck, her nail broke. Looks like a fight, doesn't it? No. Not at all? Well, it might look like it, but it wasn't. You said that you had to, in the police interview, you had to drag her out of the car. Do you remember that? I do remember that. You also said that she rolled out at first, but you put her back in. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. You said that the door kept closing. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. If you're standing between the passenger door and the car when it's open, you'd be facing Barbara on the seat. The door would be behind you, right? Beside me, yes. Wouldn't it just be easy to just keep the door on your back, hold it open, and attend to Barb? A lot of things would have been easy. Well, that would have been easy, right? I can't say that. Well keep the door open pretty easily with your behind, right? Right? Uh, you could, yes. And you said she first rolled out, but you had to put her back in to get the pipe out of the way, right? Yes. How was the pipe in the way? I don't remember how it was in the way. It was hanging in the way. In the hanging. way of what? What was in the way of? The pipe was hanging through the windshield. Yeah down past the, by the seat. Yeah. What was in the way of? Getting Barb out of the car. Okay. The pipe wasn't lodged in the windshield solid, was it? It was loose? Yes. You could just take that pipe and just slide it back out from the inside and attend to Barb, right? In a perfect world, yes. Well, in any world, right? In this world. Objection argumentative. Sustained. Why wouldn't it be easy in this world to slide the pipe out and attend I to her? I wasn't think. I mean, I wasn't thinking that. Well, I don't know. I mean, um, the door wouldn't stay open, and I was trying to contend with her. And she was unconscious. At that point, yes. It wouldn't have been easy to just pick her up and move her out, would it? It wasn't. No. Why wasn't it easy? Because something was caught on her. What was caught on her? I don't know what it was. Well, there wasn't anything down by her feet, was there? Something down there was caught on her, yes. The only thing in the photos is her shoe. Okay. Well, what, what would have been caught on her then? I, I don't, Objection something was caught on her. for speculation, asked and answered. Overruled. Yet you don't answer. know? I don't know. One of her shoes was left in the vehicle and the other shoe was behind you, next to the car, right? Yes. Were they kicked off in a struggle outside the car? No. Did it look like scuff marks from a shoe on the side of the car to you? I didn't see it. You saw the pictures? Yes, I did. Did you throw one shoe back in the car and couldn't find the other shoe because it was so far behind you? No. Well, you didn't drag her out over that seat, did you? The passenger seat? Did you pick her up or drag her out? I kind of pulled her out. Pulled her out? You saw the dirt on the side of the passenger seat, right? Yes. Didn't look disturbed, did it? No. Nope. Now you said to the police that a pipe came off the truck. Do you remember that? 
I did say that, yes. You said it a number of times, didn't you? I did, yes. You actually said that you saw it as it came off the truck, right? I did one time, yes. You said it rolled off the truck, right? I thought so, yes. Now today you said you didn't know what it was until after it hit the car, right? Yes. You thought it might be a bird at first? Yeah. Did you think a bird would come through the windshield? No. You wouldn't have to hit your fist at the windshield for a bird, would you? No. If you didn't know what it was until after it was in the car, why would you need to hit the windshield? Because I did say at one point that I, it was a pipe. Well, you said at one point, but do you see a pipe coming at you through the air? I did at, at yes, I did see a pipe coming. At what point? I couldn't tell you, I don't remember. It went pretty fast, right? Yes. And if at first you didn't even recognize it, you had even less time to react, right? Yes. And you motioned on direct examination of how you punched the windshield and you motioned with your left arm across your body up towards the windshield, right? That's how I thought it was, yes. But you had marks on all eight knuckles of your fist, right? Yes. And injury to your thumb, right? Yes. You think reaching over your body, you wouldn't just hit the back of your hand? I don't know. Well, it's because it didn't happen, right? Yes, it did happen. You punched the windshield with enough force that quick because you thought you saw a pipe coming at the windshield. Yes. And you didn't react. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, everybody. This is Jesse Weber. I'm here with Kendall Coffey, a former federal prosecutor, talking about the Todd Kenhammer case. Uh, Kendall, we were listening to the cross-examination of Todd Kenhammer when he was on the defense, uh, when he was on the witness stand. How do you think he did under uh, that cross-examination? Because again, he couldn't talk, he couldn't really precisely articulate how Barb was caught in the car. You know, what was she caught in? Uh, he doesn't even know how the pipe was in the way. Um, there was a a lot of questions that he had about what the object was coming towards the car. Again, speaking about these um, these vague details, how much of it is the fact that if someone's in a car accident, they might have trouble remembering, or how much of it is someone's covering something up? Well, he didn't do well. Uh, that's an understatement. And it comes down to the, the possibilities that you suggested. If the jury finds that there's something sympathetic about him, uh, that he just doesn't have a cold-blooded look of a killer, the robotic tone uh, of a killer. They might say, well, anyone who's in a car accident like that, they lose their wife, they're so shaken, they're so traumatized, there's going to be a lot that they remember or remember badly or get confused about, and that that condition uh, is something that in human terms is understandable. Uh, if, on the other hand, they, they keep looking for something to back up his story. And as the cross-examination points out, none of the things that might have backed up the story uh, are happening. It's just all him with a confused, not well-remembered story. And obviously he's got the ultimate self-serving testimony. Then they, they could certainly, uh, certainly find plenty of basis to, uh, to convict. Most of the time a witness with this many inconsistencies would uh, would lose credibility and not not be accepted. But the prosecutor also tried to get into issues at, at different points of the cross examination to develop motive to show that there was stress mm -hmm. about not showing up for work or problems uh, of a medium level. And I don't think anything that the prosecutor developed is going to tell the average juror that this is a man with a motive to murder his wife in a brutal way. Uh, and I just share very quickly one, one experience I had where I thought in a trial, I pounded the defendant like a drum uh, with inconsistencies and, and impeachment. We got it. There was a directed verdict on the case, so we never went to the, uh, the question. But afterwards, speaking to some of the jurors, they still thought that uh, there were sympathetic things about the defendant. And, and while I may have knocked him around in the ring. There, there wasn't the <laughs> KO that I thought there was. And, and I just mentioned that because even with a very effective cross-examination right. and a right. lot, a lot of holes in the story, Kendall, you know what? they might I, still find a reasonable doubt. Kendall, I'm sorry to interrupt, and the, the, uh, but we actually do have a live feed right now in the Todd Kenhammer case. So we'll be back here with uh, Kendall to talk more analysis, but let's go to the live feed right now.